back in Iowa, it was a great time because we went back and uh, my niece was, had graduated high school and so we went back for the celebration and something happened that was kind of a surprise for me that kind of fit what was going on here uh, this morning and uh, for our series. But uh, there was this woman that showed up to, to kind of give thanks or appreciation and, and uh, congratulations and all that stuff to my niece and uh, she looked at me and if you've ever been in these moments before, they're like, they say stuff like this, they'll say, remember me? And you're looking at them and you're like going, no, <laughs> Man, I'm so sorry, I don't know who you are. It's like, where are you from this area? Anyway, she goes, I was your neighbor for like 20 years. And it's like, oh, so sorry. But anyways, so we were talking and uh, it was my neighbor from, uh, that I grew up with and she was a couple of years older than I. And, uh, and it was really cool. She had said, uh, we were kind of catching up on our lives and, and, and she said, and she goes, where are you at? And I said, I'm in Indiana. And she goes, oh, that's right, you're a pastor. And she's like, how long have you been a pastor? I said, oh, a little over 20 years. And she's like, man, I knew you when you were little, and I never would have guessed you ever, <laughs> ever be a pastor. And I was sitting there going, I was like, you know what? I was thinking about that, and I was looking back over my life, and I was thinking, you know what? I never planned my life. I didn't plan it. Now, when I was thinking about, like, college graduates, who are, where are the college graduates here? Any, or not college graduates, but high school graduates. Where are the high school graduates? Anybody? In this, I know we got one of them, and there's a couple in the other service, and two. Okay, so I, you, the one question that everybody wants to ask you is what? What, what are you going to do next, right? And some of you are like, I don't know. <laughs> and they're like, well, okay. And uh, that's the one question that it seems to be uh, pervasive in, in people's minds. It's like, when you're graduating, it's, what are you going to do next? And then maybe for some of you, it's like, when you graduate college, you're like, what are you going to do next? And then maybe it's like, uh, you get a job and you're changing jobs and you're like, well, what are you going to do now? And then maybe you're retired and you're thinking about um, what to do next. And people are saying, so now that you're retired, what are you going to do now, right? And so it's this whole idea of what's God's plan or story for my life? Does God even have a plan for my life? And uh, I don't know about you, but you might be thinking, there's two questions you can actually be asking. You could be thinking of the overarching plan, like the umbrella kind of thing, where it's like the story of my life, the ultimate purpose of my life. Or you may be saying, hey, listen, I'm not so sure about that, but, but all I know is like little bits uh, little pieces al along the way. And, uh, and that's what I want to encourage you about. I, I, the question is, does God have a plan for my life? And people are asking that question. People want to know. I, I Googled it this morning, and um, it came up. I, I Googled, um, does God have a plan uh, for my life? A question mark at Google. Because you know Google knows everything, right? So I, I, I Googled it, and uh, do you know how many responses came up? Over 800 million responses came up. And I thought, that's just the responses to that question. Think about all the people that have asked that question. Trillions of people, I mean, all throughout the ages, have been asking this question, does God have a plan for my life? And will I find it out? Will I figure it out? What if I really mess this thing up? Like, is God going to, like, kick me out of heaven and say, oh, you, you didn't get that right, sorry, you're out. You know, I mean, and it creates a lot of anxiety. And, and I want to I answer that question because I think the Bible does answer some of these tough questions. The answer is the, the big umbrella question, the big uh, idea question, and also those little minor questions like what, am I, what kind of toothpaste am I going to buy? You know, It's like I, I got that, but I also what am I going to do with my life? Those are questions that I believe that God answers. And uh, so we're going to look at it through the story of Jeremiah. And so um, I want to open with prayer and uh, get started. And uh, so why don't you bow with me. Put your hands out in front of you. We do this uh, just to say, Holy Spirit, come into this moment because uh, we need him, okay? So uh, you don't have to, but, um, but you can. Uh, put your hands out. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And, Lord, we just are so grateful that uh, we get to worship and exalt you and uh, to celebrate you, who you are, and what you've done in our lives. And God, I pray this morning, as we have a lot of people that needed prayer this morning, and, you, and there's probably a lot of requests of, from, in, in the hearts of folks here that didn't come forward, but Lord, we lift them up to you, and we know that you know exactly what's going on. And Lord, we pray that you would do what only you can do. Move mountains, we pray. And Lord, this morning, now we just want to open up your word, and we know that your word says that it's living and active and that it can change our lives. And God, there is a, a pervading question, and that is, do you have a plan for our lives? 
And we're trying to figure that out. And when we look at each other and we look at our past, we kind of say, whoa, I never would have thought that. And Lord, we, we kind of see this limited scope going forward. And so we need to know, do you have a plan? Do you know what you're doing? Do you have an overarching plan for our life? And can we trust it? Lord, we love you. We give you glory and honor and praise. Holy Spirit, now we pray you speak. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Okay, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1. And uh, a little bit about Jeremiah. This is an interesting book, one of the, the, the uh, like a biography in, um, in, in the Bible, which is really cool. And, uh, but a little bit about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was uh, born, to the, he was the son of a priest. Uh, the priest's name is Heliel, uh, 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 Hilkiah. And, uh, and Hilkiah was a priest in Anathoth, and that's where they grew up. So he's born and, born and raised there. And a little bit about, um, about that. We don't know. It's like the northeast side of Jerusalem. It's like a little suburb. And we don't know how many people were there. But um, just to understand geography, it's like the, the, the kingdom was divided at that time. If you understand the histories, um, that there was, it was all one people under David and Solomon. And then after that, it became a divided kingdom. There was the north, known as Israel. The south, known as Judah. And uh, he was living in Jerusalem, which is in the southern uh, the southern part, which is in the southern kingdom, uh, in Judah. And, um, and, and so he's, he's the son of a priest, and so he's growing up in this town. And oftentimes in that culture, um, it was like you already knew what you were going to do. Like if he was graduating high school, he would have known what he, like how to answer that question. So when they said to Jeremiah, hey, Jeremiah, you know, uh, are you a bullfrog? No, they didn't ask that question. But they, they said, hey, Jeremiah. Some of you are like young, and you're looking at me like, what was that? Um, Find an old person, and they will happily answer that question for you. But Jeremiah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the rest of your life, you know? I mean, seriously, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? And in that culture, they would have known. Because what they oftentimes would do, the son would follow the trade of his father. Now, he's probably from the Levitical line, so he would have been, he would have automatically been a, been a, been a priest, just like, um, like Joseph uh, uh, with Jesus. Jesus was the son of a what? of a carpenter, and that's where Jesus would have gotten his carpentry skills, right? So this was a part of the life. So for him, it's almost like, like this is the story of my life. And you can a little, for Jeremiah, he probably could rest in that, like knowing, hey, I know what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I'm going to be a priest because just like my dad, that's just what we do, right? And see, a priest would take care of the responsibilities at the temple, and so it was a little bit um, kind of predictable. But that was, that was for Jeremiah, Jeremiah, they think, was born around 655 B.C. They don't know because it doesn't tell us in the biblical text, but extra-biblical resources and histories kind of put him, kind of mark him down as around 655 B.C. Again, question mark, but around there. And, uh, but God shows up and says, listen, I want to totally change your plans. You thought you were going to be a priest, but listen, I've got other plans for you. And he shows up. In 626 B.C., he's 29 years old. So if you're like 19, 20, if you're below 29, take a big deep breath and go, it's okay. Right? So God shows up and says, listen, I want to reveal something to you. I want to share something with you so you're not too freaked out. I've got a plan for your life, and this is what I want to show you what it is. And look at, look at chapter 1. And look at verse 5. This is what it says. Uh, verse 4 says, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah says. And he says this, which I love it. You're going to find the answer to these questions in the language. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. He says, before I what? What's the next word? Before I formed you. It's the word created. And uh, he says, before I created you in the womb, I what? I knew you. Now let me unpack that a little bit because that's pretty cool. So what he's saying is this. Do you remember when I was talking to you about that? In the Genesis chapter 1, there are two words that are used for creation. There's the, basa, there's the bara and the asa. Do you guys remember that, for those of you that have been here? Okay. For those of you that weren't, you, you need to get here, right? <laughs> we love it that you're here. So go back and watch it, you know, so you can check it out. But, but the, the word created, asa, means that it was something was created from something. Okay. And uh, so a lot of the stuff that God created was created from something. 
But then there's the word bara, which is this word of created from nothing. Okay? There's two times he uses that. In the first verse, which is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was not there, but God created it, and it was there. That's bara. And so then all the stuff is the asa. And then it gets down to when he creates people. He says um, that he creates male and female uh, in the image of God, he creates them. He uses both of those words. So the idea is that you're Asa and Bara and together. The idea is that the Bara is the suke, the soul of you. And that is, he is not, you're not, you are not created from something. You're created from nothing. God knew exactly what he was doing when he created you. That's how uniquely you are you. Because you weren't created from, th- from something. That's how, that's how awesome. And that's why Psalm 139 says, For I am fearfully and wonderfully made, miraculously made. That's bara. But then the asa is, is your flesh, right? This is where he says he took Adam and made him from what? The dust of the ground. So he, he's asa Adam, his flesh, from something which was dust. And that's where you get your flesh. So when he says this to Jeremiah, he, says, he shows up and he says, listen, before I formed you, before I I barad you and assad you. I knew you. Now, okay, you're not marveled by that yet. Okay, the word knew is, I knew you, is the word yada. It's the Hebrew word. It's like, I know you. It's, it's the word for sexuality, which is, I, there's not a square inch of you that I do not know. I know you fully. I know you completely. I know everything about you. I know your likes and I know your dislikes. I know that you will love coconut cream pie and despise butterscotch, right? I know that about you. I know that you're an extrovert or you're an introvert. I know that you're a thinker or I know that you're a feeler. I know that you love to be in front of a crowd and I know you hate it with a passion. Like, I know you. I mean, you think about that. You're like, well, that's no doubt because God is omniscient. Absolutely. But what Jeremiah is finding out from God is this one piece of it is that God completely knows him. So it's kind of like, well, that's pretty cool. Thanks. Before I was even born, you know, before I was even formed, you knew me. But then he goes on to say this. Before you were what? Born. I mean, that's after the... The bara and the asa come together and it's forming in your mother's womb. He says, before you were born, what did he do? He says, I set you apart. What he's saying is, I've got a plan. I, the, the idea is this, that I've got an, an, an overarching plan for your life. I know you and I know what I want to do through you. And Jeremiah's going, whoa, this is pretty cool. I I get it. God, I know I'm going to be a priest because that's just what we do. And then he says, I appointed you, what? I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. See, what Jeremiah was going to find out was God has his plans and we have ours. And the ultimately in the end is are we going to let God do his thing or are we going to continue to do our thing? Now, God created us with a free will and so we're going to live this life one step at a time with our free will making decisions and all this kind of stuff. But is it aimlessly? Is it just kind of sporadically? Or is there an overall plan that God is trying to accomplish? You see, God wants to use Jeremiah to change the lives of those in Israel. See, he wants to use him as a prophet. A prophet is one that's going to be used by God as a mouthpiece. Like, I, I've got a message that I want to speak through your life. And, uh, and, and, he, and he's like, what's that message? And the message is actually twofold. Two things. He wants him to go and tell them, listen, you're running away from God. Cut it out. You're running away from me. And it's only going to lead you in a, raw, in a bad end, in a bad direction. So cut it out. How do you think that's going to go? Well, and then he says basically also the second part of that message is you're also not only running away from me, you're running to something and that is uh, into idolatry. You're worshiping false gods. See, Jeremiah's like, hey, you've got a new plan. This is my plan for you. And Jeremiah's like, oh, whoa, okay. So Jeremiah gets to work, and he goes to be God's mouthpiece to his people. 
How do they respond to him? Have anybody read Jeremiah? He's the weeping prophet for a reason. I mean, the, the people rejected him. The people said, listen, we, they, they mocked him, they ridiculed him, they refused to listen, and even they would take him and beat him. And Jeremiah's kind of going, time out. If I'm doing what God wants me to do, shouldn't it just be going easy? <laughs> you know? Wouldn't that be great? Like, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, I would think it would be smooth road, smooth sailing, and let's do this. And Jeremiah gets a little bit confused, like, did I miss this? Did I misunderstand God's plan for my life? I want you to turn over in your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter 20. Keep going with me. Hang in there. So look, look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah has a moment. He has a breakdown. Anybody have a breakdown with God before? Like, okay, three of you. All right, I get it. I get it. It's like you and I, God, need to talk. Because I'm not liking how this is going. And this is what he says. He says, oh, Lord. So they're having coffee, and he says, oh, Lord, you what? You deceived me. He said, I was deceived. You, you were too strong. You overpowered me. You prevailed. Do you, do you not see what's going on? I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, because you tell me to speak, I cry out, and what I have to say brings violence and destruction because that's what the Lord of the Lord has brought me. Insult and reproach. How long? All day long. It's like I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused. So it's like if I do this, this is what's happening, and I'd rather not have that. But if I don't say anything, check this out. He says, but if I say, I will not mention him, or I'm just going to quit. I'm not going to do this anymore, or speak any more in his name. His word is like, like uh, in my heart, like a fire. And it's like a fire shut up in my bones. He says, I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, what? I can't. So it's like, I, I thought it was going to be easy because I know it's hard, but hey, I'm following your plan here. And they're not liking it very much. But if I stop, I'm just, it's bursting inside of me. Because in the end, that's God's plan for him. He goes on to say, he says, I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Report him. Let's report him. All my friends, say friends. Friends. These are friends are waiting for me to slip up, saying, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. These are friends? Like, seriously? you got to get yourself some new friends. So everybody's against him. Nobody likes what he has to say. But then he says, but the Lord then is with me, like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. They will diso their dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. In other words, what he's saying is, I've dedicated my life to following you. It's not a mistake, is it? I mean, I think it's the right move. Sing to the Lord, he says, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. And then he has this down moment where he says, cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, hey, you have a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning and a battle cry at noon. For he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave. Her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever, I mean, do you hear the desperation? Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to the end of my days? See, what Jeremiah doesn't realize is that God, yes, has a plan for his life. And no, it's not always easy. And when you run against some obstacles following the Lord, there are moments of depression where you start to think, have I screwed this up? Have I completely missed him? But see, what we're doing is we're living one step at a time. We don't see the end goal. You see, because your life has an opportunity to influence another life, and that life, God has plans for them too. 
but God wants to use you to intersect with them so that their lives can be forever changed. Can I just pause right there? So that girl was saying, I never thought you would ever be a pastor. I never would have guessed that. And I said, frankly, I didn't either. I was a punk of a kid. I knew nothing. My dad said he would run after me, and he kind of likes to joke about it. He says, I used to run after you go, I'm going to kill you, boy. <laughs> and then he tried to chase me. I'm going to kill you, boy. You know, I was like, no, dad, don't. That's okay. We don't need to reminisce anymore. It's over. I'm 43. <laughs> but my dad, we're all listening to this, and I just told her, I, I told her, I said, can I tell you something? Jesus changed my life. And I'm sitting in the garage, and my next-door neighbor is the one who had walked across the street. And said, would you guys like to come to church? And my life was forever changed. I didn't plan that. See, it's never easy. But God's plan over our lives, we're just following him one step at a time and saying, God, however you want to use me, I just want to be used by you because there are people in my life that you want to use my story and my life. Even if I screw things up, even if I mess it up, whatever it is, you want to use me to rub shoulders with them so that their lives could be forever changed too. See, Jeremiah just forgot. He didn't see forward. He could only see backwards. And see, so he gives this story, fast forward in the story to, they didn't listen to him. And God brought judgment and Nebuchadnezzar and his army came and conquered them and ripped them out of their homes and took them to Babylon. And Jeremiah in Jerusalem sends a letter to all the exiles to give them hope that there is a story and there is a plan for your life. So turn in your Bibles real quick, Jeremiah 29. You've heard this, I'm sure, before. And um, Jeremiah says this in this letter. He says in verse 10, This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise, and that is to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. And the word you in the Hebrew is plural. He's not talking to just Jeremiah anymore. He's talking to every one of them. This is why I can answer that question to you. Does God have a plan for your life? And my answer to that question is yes. He does it personally. And he does it in a community. I have a plan for you. And he says, and, and he goes on to say, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, there's a connection here from this letter back to Jeremiah 1.5. For I know, yada, God says, I know in every detail, the story of your life. I know my plan for you. And the word plans is, is, is not the details of your life. It's the overarching purpose of your life. And so God works with free will to kind of say, here's the story of your life. And all you're doing is looking one step ahead saying, God, I just want to do what you want me to do. And when people ask you that question, that's the best answer that you could ever give. Now you might say, well, that doesn't answer some of the questions. I know. Because some of the questions are like, well, should I go to this school or should I go to the military? Should I take this job or should I just flat out retire? There's all these questions and God allows you the freedom to make choices. But in the end, Proverbs says this, many are the plans that a man has, but the Lord determines his steps. What I'm just going to say is this. The Lord will guide you where he wants you to go, even with the decisions that you make. That when you stop where you are and you look back and you say, wow, I, I never would have planned this, but this is where God has led me, and all he wants me to do is go one step at a time. 
I've asked Devin Hostetler to come, and, and I wanted him to share with you his journey. He's also, uh, I wanted hit you to get to know him a little bit better as an upcoming elder. Um, but he's looking over his life going, here I am, and this is where I've come from. So, Devin, go ahead and share with us uh, your story. Yeah, I, I, I love my conversations that I have with uh, Russ and over time, but on occasion you get these text messages from him and you're almost afraid to open them up because you don't know what he's going to ask you to do, and <laughs> you end up in front of the church with a microphone in your hand. So, um, yeah, this morning he asked me to get my testimony, and uh, obviously every testimony has to have a message. I mean, that's the reason we have testimonies, right? And so I'll tell you the, the, uh, the message of it before I start. And the message is, is that if you have a son or a daughter or a child that's uh, walked away from Christ or is not following Christ, that prayer alone can bring them back. And I'll tell you the story of that. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. Most all of you know my parents, Lowell and Carolyn Hosettler. Um, you know, mom's on these videos like every Sunday morning, multiple <laughs> videos. She's always got something going on, and she's always been like that ever since, ever since I was little. She's always been like that. So we've always been extremely involved in church, um, growing up all the way through elementary school and the junior high and high school. And, uh, you know, at all those church events that we went to, you know, there were times that, you know, I had made, you know, a commitment as you do with a, as a kid, you know, accept Lord into your heart. And then, but what does that evolve to over time? And for me, it didn't really evolve into anything, um, going into junior high and high school. And I never denied the Lord's existence or his greatness or who he was. Um, I just didn't seek him is really what it came down to. And then, uh, you know, rolling out of high school and going to college, then you don't have anybody making you go to church. You know, mom wasn't there to drag me to all the, all the church events. So, you know, I, I didn't go to church. I didn't, uh, I didn't get involved in any um, Christian organizations on campus. Um, I just did my own thing all the way through college. And, uh, and again, all the way through there, you know, I never denied God's existence. I wasn't upset at him. I wasn't mad at him. I just wasn't seeking him. And uh, so I get out of college, and now I'm back home, and I'm on, you know, the job search. And like a lot of times you get out of college, you move back in with mom and dad for a period of time. And so that's what I did. And, uh, you know, so of course I'm back home. We'll go to the church again. So I, I kid you not, I'm, I'm home for like, I think it was like the second weekend that I was home. And we're attending church over at, it was Calvary Chapel at the time in the old school over here. And uh, so go in on Sunday morning, no different than any other Sunday morning. I mean, I wasn't seeking the Lord on that morning in any way. It was just, I was going through the motions. I was going to church. And uh, so it, it was a baptism morning. And I, I couldn't tell you what the, the pastor's message was that morning. I couldn't tell you what the worship songs were. Um, and again, I, I wasn't seeking the Lord that morning. I'm just there. But at some point, at, towards the end, when the pastor was doing this altar call, all of a sudden, I'm overcome with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, you know, that point where you're, like, weeping, and you're like, you know, what's going on? You know, I didn't, I didn't order this. Where did it come from? And, uh, and I went forward that morning, and, and I was baptized and uh, made a commitment to the Lord on that morning. And, you know, of course, there's ups and downs as you go down that journey. But looking back at it, you know, there's really nothing more than the prayer from my parents that led to that that morning because, again, you know, I wasn't seeking the Lord. So anyone who's got kids that are not seeking the Lord, not following the Lord, that continuous prayer is so important. And that alone, you know, I was fortunate. I didn't have to hit that rock bottom point in life. I didn't have a tragedy in my life. I didn't have any of that. Um, I had parents that were praying for me, and the Lord took me in that morning. Um, so that, that's, that's the message of my testimony. So that was in uh, May of 95 is when, is when that happened. So, you know, that was 22 years ago. So, you know, a lot of steps between then and here. And, uh, you know, I'll fast forward to, to four years ago when we came here to Brighton. And uh, uh, my wife and I, we had been attending a church prior to that. And um, I was an elder at that church. And I'm just going to say there was, you know, a situation that occurred that we had to walk away from. And it's not really about what the situation was. Um, you know, we all have, just in Jeremiah, as he was speaking there, we, always, we all have events that happen in our lives, and what we learn from and what, the, what Christ taught us during those moments is what's important out of that. And everyone that was involved in that prior um, situation, you know, I love them, no hard feelings. But it was something that we had to walk away from. 
it was something that, you know, I couldn't fix. And, yeah, I had a lot of questions asking the Lord, you know, you know, why did this have to happen this way? You know, why didn't, why didn't you fix it, Lord, at that time? You know, why did it have to happen? So, you know, we, we roll into here four years ago, and so now I've got this attitude, right? I'm like, okay, well, I'm never getting back to church leadership again because I'm telling you right now that, you know, if stuff like this is going to happen, you know, I don't want to have any part of it. So I'm just going to come here, and I'm just going to smile and wave, you know? I'm going to show up a Sunday morning, and they ask for help doing something. I'm just going to smile and wave. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to get involved. Um, I'm not going to become a member of the church. If you become a member, then they ask you to do things. So can you stay away from that, right? <laughs> so that was part of my plan. Well, as time, as the healing process, you know, went on, we started stepping back in a little bit and getting a little more involved. We um, initially had helped with uh, the junior high youth, and then um, when Troy came on, it was, uh, you know, helping with the youth group. Uh, we've done the small groups and, you know, different involvements within the church. And then, um, you know, the Lord's really convicted me over this time that, okay, you know, why are you just sitting back? Why aren't you be getting more involved in, in the church itself? And um, it was just this reoccurring question was coming up as I had a lot of excuses why I wasn't. I mean, I, I'm busy. I'm binge watching like five different shows on Netflix right now. So, <laughs> right? Yeah, Hayden knows. Yeah. I mean, it's like a marathon schedule to keep that up. It's, it's difficult. So I've got a lot of stuff going on. I've got a family. I've got kids. I get all, every, we all have reasons why we don't want to get overly involved and overly commit ourselves. And a, a couple of years ago, um, I read a book. and It was a book. I don't read books, but I read a book. And I did it because it was, it was part of a fight club. It was called Manly, Manly Man. And uh, it was, it was uh, a bunch of different stories, um, obviously, from the Bible as well as uh, just great men in America over the years. And the author, um, at one point, he was talking about Abraham Lincoln and all of the, you know, trials and tribulations and heartache in his life and, and, uh, and then his successes in life as well. And the, the author, he, he made this comment, and I, it, it kind of stuck with me, so I, I always, I've got it written down several places, but I kind of keep it near. Um, and he, and he, the author said this, he says, I believe most men make peace with their defects they accept their flaws as simply the way they are. So they never declare war on those parts of themselves that keep them from exceptional lives. Mediocrity becomes their lot in life. Merely getting by is their only hope. Now, I don't, I don't accept that in my professional life. You know, I'm always, we're always training. We're always looking for the next thing we can learn. How can we advance ourselves? And so why should I accept that in my Christian life is what it came down to. And that word meteorocracy, and what, you know, how can I, what does that associate with in the Bible? There's one word that we've all heard many times called lukewarm. Really, is the same thing. And in uh, Revelation 3, verse 15, it starts, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. So, that was the conviction that I was feeling that, okay, that's not in a position I want to be in. I don't want to live that type of life. I don't, I don't want to have that type of a testimony. So for me, you know, four years ago, I was saying I would never be looking for this type of position again. Um, you know, Rustin over the years had mentioned it several times. Just, hey, keep it in mind. You know, and every time it was like, yeah, well, that wasn't going to happen, you know. <coughs> but that was, my, that was my thought at the time. So but as that conviction over time um, the Lord led me back to this type of, uh, uh, I guess, situation, you know. So, um, but that, that, that's, that's my testimony. That's who I am, and it's how I ended up that where I'm at today. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Thanks, man. <clears throat> so, just to wrap things up, just to, just to think, Devin's looking over his life and going, man, I, I saw all this stuff happen. I'm just walking one step at a time. And, and, you know, it's those things where it's like God is leading and steering us. And he's going to take us where he wants us to go. And we can do that fighting, you know, punching, pushing, screaming, all that kind of stuff. Or we could just say, God, if you know me like you knew Jeremiah through and through, what do I have to fear? Yeah, it's not going to be easy. But, but the rewards, what you're going to do through my story, my life, could intersect with other people and forever change their lives. God wants to use you. God has a story. Now, you, 
You may be wondering, well, how do I, if I don't know what's next, how do I prepare for it? Because we like to prepare. And uh, we're going to answer that question next week. So why don't you stand for closing prayer. Would you join me? God, thank you uh, for this morning. Thank you for this story. Thank you that you have a story, that a plan for our lives. And Lord, we can just rest in that. Just take one step at a time. And Lord, sometimes we don't know all the answers and you allow us to make decisions. God, some of us can come around each other and say, hey, listen, let me give you some encouragement. Let me kind of help maybe point you in the right direction. That maybe this is what God has for you in your life. But we don't need to stress out. We just need to rest in you. Knowing that your plan, as your word says, is gonna, it's gonna come about. And, and we can just rest and follow you. Lord, I'm just so grateful for what you've done in my life. And I can only imagine the many people in this room feel the same way about their story. Thank you. Even when we have run away, even when we have been difficult and and pushed back against you, you you never let us go. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to rest in you, take one step at a time, and follow you. Lord, we love you. We give you glory and honor and praise. We commit this week to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, amen. God bless. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Well, hey, thanks for joining us and watching this video of our sermon this past Sunday. We hope it's been an encouragement to you. Uh, We believe in the ministry of what's happening at Brighton Chapel, and we believe it's going to make a difference in your life. And so we hope that you'll come back and be a part of it. We hope you'll visit us in person be a part of what's happening here at Brighton Chapel. We hope you have a great day.